Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Six days after Peter had acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the last Sunday before Lent begins. The last Sunday for sing, us to sing as many alleluias as possible and sing them loudly. This Sunday ends the season of Epiphany, which is the time when we talk about light and revelation. It's a season that we can easily overlook. We treat it usually as a day and not as a season. Sometimes we just treat it as the calm before the dark storm that is Lent. Lent isn't really stormy. It's just a season we happen to associate with suffering and darkness. The first day of Lent is Ash Wednesday. What do we do on Ash Wednesday? We smear ash on people's foreheads and remind them that they're going to die. It's truly a wonder that anyone comes to that service. <laughs> this gospel reading is an interesting transition from Epiphany to Lent. It's a story of light and revelation, but there's also a certain foreboding within the story. Well, it's actually on either end of the story. Right before Jesus ascended the mountain with three of his disciples, he explained that he would have to suffer and die. Peter argued with Jesus when he made this revelation. Peter could not wrap his head around the idea that the Messiah, the person who was supposed to save them all, was going to suffer and be killed. It was after this information was relayed that Jesus brought his friends to the top of the mountain. I've often wondered about the timing. Was Jesus trying to provide some clarity for his disciples about the message he'd just given them? Perhaps the time to process it all? Or was he just trying to give them some quality time for people who were probably reeling from this new and disturbing information. We really don't know. We often hear people talk about mountaintop experiences. Sometimes it's literally about the experience of climbing a mountain and getting to the top and witnessing this extraordinary view that just takes your breath away. Sometimes people use that phrase to describe a moment of transcendence, a moment when they felt closer to God a time of faith and assurance. We actually use that phrase for a lot of different things. However, Jesus' disciples would have had some specific associations with mountaintops. The mountain was where heaven and earth met. It was a place where people encountered the divine. You forget, they didn't have planes then. Right? The mountaintop was the closest people got to what they perceived heaven to be. 
Mountains are mentioned more than 500 times in the Bible, most notably in Moses' interactions with the voice of God. This is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Important things happened on mountains in the Jewish faith. And all of Jesus' disciples would have known these stories and thus known the significance of the mountaintop. Therefore, it's not surprising that these amazing things would happen to the, at the top of a mountain. First, Jesus was transfigured before them, meaning his face began to glow, his clothes appeared extra bright. And then, two prophets who were long since dead, dead for hundreds of years, appeared besides Jesus. And after that, a voice from heaven spoke to the disciples. And here's the crazy thing. Of all those miraculous events that happened on the mountaintop that day, it wasn't the glowing, shining Jesus or the two dead prophets back to life. It was something as simple as a voice. That's what really got the disciples' attention. It wasn't just any voice. It was God's voice. And for once, God was speaking directly to the disciples. And that's what really terrified them. They were accustomed to things happening to Jesus, and maybe even the people around them. They had witnessed many miracles in their time with Jesus. But this was different because God was talking to them, and more importantly, he was telling them to do something to listen to Jesus. And what had Jesus just told them? He had told them that he had to suffer and die, and they too would have to take up their cross if they wanted to be his followers, meaning they had to suffer. It's not the kind of thing you want to hear from a heavenly voice. It's the kind of thing you want to tell yourself was just a big misunderstanding. And of course, Jesus didn't mean that he was going to really suffer and die. When these three disciples heard the voice from heaven, they fell to the ground in fear. Because the ground was what they knew. It was firm. It was steady. And maybe, just maybe, they stayed there for a while. They could forget everything that happened. Have you ever felt that way if you just stayed in bed for long enough? Maybe everything didn't really happen. And then Jesus bent over and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw it was just him. Jesus. Just the way it should be. And maybe they thought it was all a dream and they could forget it. But no. Jesus was sure to remind them on the way, that, uh, way down the mountain that he was going to suffer and die. And this time, no one argued with him. Lent isn't merely a time of suffering and darkness. It's a time when we confront certain truths, maybe truths that we don't want to confront. It's a time to repent from our sins. No one likes to talk about sin. And thus, no one likes to talk about repentance. But repentance isn't just feeling guilt and shame. It's a reorientation. It's an opportunity to change for the better. The reason we talk about the story of the transfiguration right before Lent is to remind us that even in the midst of suffering and repentance, there is also glory and light. There is a God who desperately wants us to listen to him, but is also willing to get on the ground with us, put his hand on our shoulder and say, it's time to get up and stop living in fear. On the way down, Jesus told his disciples not to tell anyone about what happened until he was resurrected. And that seems like a strange thing to say. You would think he would want people to talk about this wonderful thing they saw, because maybe it would help more people believe. I like to think he told them this because he knew that they would need this reminder of light, a light that we can 
find even in the darkest of times. They didn't need to use this moment to evangelize and teach. It was a place for just them to return to in their mind and heart when the world seemed to be ending. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, they could close their eyes, see the light, feel his hand on their shoulder, telling them not to be afraid. And that's what many of us need. A reminder to find courage when we are afraid. A reminder that we need not fear the terror of the night, that we can confront those things that we would rather avoid and forget. Lent is a time to face our fears, our failures, and our sins. But to do that with the confidence that those failures and sins can never defeat us. Because we have a God who can both glorify the earth and also kneel down in the dirt, brush us off, and tell us not to be afraid. Because glory, God's glory, is all around us. Amen.